Because of the structure of alcohol, it is what's called both water soluble and fat soluble. What that means is when you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. So unlike a lot of substances and drugs that actually attach to the surface of cells, to receptors as they're called, little parking spots, and then trigger a bunch of downstreams, like domino cascades of effects, alcohol actually has its own direct effects on cells because it can really just pass into those cells. And the fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains its damaging effects, okay? It is substantial stress and damage to cells. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. Because when you ingest ethanol, NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. So it's important that your body be able to do this conversion very quickly. And the place where it does that is within the liver. And cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process. But they are cells and they are exposed to the acetylaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the alcohol metabolism events. So the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body and some percentage of that worse poison is converted into a form of calories that you can use to generate energy, generate ATP. And the reason why alcohol is considered empty calories is because that entire process is very metabolically costly, but there's no real nutritive value of the calories that it creates. You can use it for immediate energy, but it can't be stored in any kind of meaningful or beneficial way. It doesn't provide any vitamins. It doesn't provide any amino acids. It doesn't provide any fatty acids. It's truly empty calories. Now, the important thing to understand is that it is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. And so we should ask ourselves like which neural circuits, what brain areas, what body areas involved in feeling drunk or inebriated. Now in thinking about this state of being tipsy or happy or really drunk or a little bit drunk, for people that are regular drinkers or that have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism, when they drink, they tend to feel very energized and very good for longer periods of time. Again, people who have a genetic predisposition to alcohol or people who are chronic drinkers or even just, if you recall, chronic doesn't have to mean a ton of alcohol, but they're drinking one or two per night or they're every other night type drinkers or Thursday through Sunday drinkers. Those people typically experience an increase in alertness and mood when they drink, whereas occasional drinkers will have a briefer, meaning less long lasting, period of feeling good when they drink and then more quickly transition into a state in which they're tired or they start losing motor skills, they start slurring their speech. And thinking about the biochemical effects of alcohol and what it's doing to the body, what it's doing in all cases is it's consumed into the gut, right? Goes into the stomach. The liver immediately starts this conversion that we talked about before of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate. And some amount of acetylaldehyde and acetate are making it into the brain. It crosses the blood brain barrier. Again, the brain has this fence around it that we call the blood brain barrier or the BBB. Many things, most things, thankfully, can't pass across the blood brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence and into the milieu, the environment of the brain, which is made up of a couple different major cell types, neurons, nerve cells, and so-called glial cells, which are in between the nerve cells. So what happens when alcohol gets into the brain that makes us feel tipsy or drunk, and in some people makes people feel really especially energized and happy? Well, alcohol is indiscriminate in terms of which brain areas it goes to. Again, it doesn't bind to particular receptors, but it does seem to have a propensity or an affinity for particular brain areas that are involved in certain kinds of thinking and behavior. So one of the first things that happens is that there's a slight, at least after the first drink or second drink, there's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning and 
perhaps above all in suppression of impulsive behavior. So if you go to a party and they're serving alcohol and people are consuming drinks, what you'll notice is that a few minutes into that party, the volume of people's voices will increase. And that's because people are simply not paying attention to their voice modulation. As other people start speaking more loudly, other people are speaking more loudly. We've all had this experience, right? Of going to a party and then you step outside for a moment and you go, oh my goodness, I was shouting. You come over the next day, you got a sore throat. It might be that you picked up some sort of bug, some virus or something. But oftentimes it's just the fact that you've been shouting all night just to be heard because as the prefrontal cortex shuts down, people stop modulating their, their level of speech quite as much. Also notice that people start gesticulating more, people start standing up and sitting down more, they'll start walking around more if there's brain thinned in ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. This is something that's not often talked about when discussing the effects of alcohol. And we all know the effects of being drunk can be bad, right, can be, bad in terms of judgment, motor coordination, certainly driving drunk is a terrible thing, get you or other people killed, and so on. But rarely do we hear about the changes in neural circuits from just one or two nights of regular drinking. Again, chronic drinking doesn't necessarily mean every day and every night. It could be the person that simply drinks every Thursday or every Friday or just once a week has three or four drinks or maybe even a few more. That person is going to experience a decrease in this top-down inhibition, so an increase in impulsivity and habitual behavior because the break on those behaviors has been removed while they're drinking, but also changes in the very neural circuits that allow habitual and impulsive behavior to occur more readily even when they're not drinking.